So in our class today, uh, Geshe-la was talking about one section in from Navartika where the <clears throat> uh, Gail Subjay was refuting that karma can be purified by uh, external means, by, you know, different ceremonies and substances and so on. So this is something I've thought about a long time because in every religion, not just Tibetan Buddhism, sometimes people say, oh, Tibetan Buddhism has so many rituals. All the Buddhist traditions have so many rituals. It's just the ones that you practice don't seem to you like rituals. The ones that you don't practice, they're rituals. Okay, but all religions have rituals, and people who aren't religious also have rituals. <clears throat> so uh, the rituals are often portrayed as uh, having some power in and of themselves, which is what is refuted. But that begs the question of, you know, long life pills that are handed out at, at long life initiations, and blessed pills, and mantra rolls that we put in statues, and uh, oh, holy water, my goodness, we have a lot of that stuff. And, uh, you know, we have blessing cords, and, uh, you know, tons of stuff. Okay, so what's going on? You know, we refute it, and then we have it. Okay. <laughs> so, it seems to me that some, just to share you some ref with you some reflections I have, is I think the purpose of these rituals are to get us to change our mind, okay? So that how we're thinking when we do the ritual uh, changes, and by changing our mind, then that affects the karma and affects different things, okay? But the thing is that mostly common people in the world think that it's the ritual itself that has some power. They don't think about changing their minds, yeah? Uh, and many Buddhist practitioners, too, think exactly like that, okay? Uh, so we have to be careful with our own mind, and, and really, uh, when we're engaging in these kinds of things, to really uh, be aware of why and what we're expecting from them, and to make sure that our own mind changes. Personally speaking, I think that many, especially the rituals uh, around death, you know, which every culture has, I think those rituals are uh, much more for the living than for the dead. When I was a child, I was remember thinking that they were doing all these things for the dead people and wondering, why are you doing that? They aren't here. Uh, you know, how are they going to get that? You know, like just the amount of uh, people pay for funerals nowadays and to get these huge, enormous caskets made of mahogany and, you know, gold handles and, I mean, stuff that's just totally amazing. And I think it's often people do that to dissolve, uh, there could be many reasons. One is to show love for the dead one, even though the deceased is not there, is not enjoying it. It's basically so that they have a way to show their, their respect. And it's also, I think, done so that if people feel guilty about how they treated somebody when they were alive, this kind of make they feel like this makes up for it. I, I know I'm not supposed to say obvious things like that, <laughs> but it's true, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and so I think a lot of times there, there's all sorts of other motivations going on. Um, I mean, the elaborate things they do for the ancestors, which, which Buddhism has too. Uh, I remember one time I was uh, in Australia and I was with a, a, a whole family, extended family of ethnic Buddhists. 
and they were starting to do some rituals for, you know, past relatives. And I just made the comment that, you know, it's, I asked how long they have been dead and, and you know, if a year, a couple of years. And I said, you know, they're already in their next life and they probably won't know any of this. They're busy in their next life. Oh, they got mad at me for, for you know, daring to Im imply that, that uh, you know, this was not going to get through to their, their, their deceased relatives. So that's what I, I really started shifting my way of thinking and acknowledging that these things are done very much for the living and recalling, uh, not, not for the dead, but for the living, and that um, very often our spiritual mentors suggest doing different rituals um, because the, the common people, and us too, um, have, will, will incorrectly believe the ritual has some power, but the fact of doing it does lay some good imprints because what they're reciting is something virtuous, okay? So you're told to recite, you know, so many uh, mantras for this, that, and the other thing. And, uh, you know, people just, uh, well, let's just accumulate the mantras. It doesn't matter whether we're paying attention, you know. Oh, I did 100,000. That's great. I can add it to the, the group count. Um, <laughs> you know, but the, the mind hasn't changed at all. Okay, but when you look at it, for that person reciting Om Mani Padme Hong, even though they're totally distracted, <clears throat> it's much better than them reciting other common mantras in our society, like, stop the steal, stop the steal, stop the steal. That's a mantra. Yeah, when I went to USC, when OJ was playing, what was he playing? Running back. Running back. Yeah. Then what was the mantra they shouted at the, at the football team, uh, the, at the games? Kill, kill, kill. You can see that planted some seeds in the mind. Um, so, you know, it's better that the people are doing something you know, if, if you're reciting Omani Pimi Hong, it has a, a very peaceful vibration, you know. Screaming, stop the steal and kill doesn't, okay? So in, in that way, it brings some benefit to the person. And maybe they think, oh, you know, Buddhism has something to offer. Or, you know, in Christianity, what do you do? You recite Hail Marys, and that's supposed to purify your karma, yeah? Yeah, oh, it keeps you out of hell. Okay, uh, yeah, how does that work? Um, <laughs> oh, yes, I've, yeah, yeah, I forgot. It's a mystery. Um, yeah, and mystery's good. Yeah, don't do any analysis like Dharmakirti did. That's bad. Um, okay. Uh, and one time, uh, when I was in Singapore, one young man came to see me. He had a brain tumor. And I uh, asked my teacher, you know, kind of for what practice to do. And he gave me one. And I gave the text, you know, to this young man. And, and I offered to explain to him how to do it. And he wasn't interested, um, which was really unfortunate. But what I did. Yeah, uh, I also suggested that he do animal liberation because freeing, you know, saving life uh, it creates good karma. He, he wasn't interested in that either. So what I said is, I want to do some animal liberation. Will you help me because I don't know where to go and I don't have transportation in Singapore. He was very happy to help me 
do animal liberation. So it kind of tricked him, you know? But I think it was good because he had a, a good mind, a compassionate mind. You know, I, as we were doing the animal liberation, I talked about how to think and so on. And then, you know, we did some prayers and imagined that we were teaching the Dharma to the animals and actually teaching it to ourselves, you know. Um, and my teacher also commented to me one time that when people have different problems, he gives them a, a short sadhana to do. And he says that way they keep their mind in virtue for at least, you know, five or 10 or 15 minutes. And uh, they may be thinking, oh, the sadhana itself, the, the puja, the ritual itself does it, but it's actually, uh, they're, as they're reciting it, they're thinking about the meaning of it a little bit, hopefully. And that is what helps their mind and affects the karma. Okay, So we always have to make sure what's going on in our mind when we're uh, doing these kinds of things. Yeah? Otherwise, we become, you know, just kind of doing automatic rituals that don't really have a whole lot of meaning. Yeah, so it's it's good to um, to think about it. You know, when you offer a high lama a kata and they touch your head, what are you supposed to think about? Yeah, I mean nobody ever explains it to you, but if you think about it, well, what you know, what what are good ways to think? Yeah, yeah, is, it, is them touching your head really? You know, I got it now, yeah. Or, or what's go, what's going on, yeah? Um, because when they they say that the Tibetan word blessing, yeah, when you really look at it closely and translate the Tibetan words literally, it doesn't literally translate into blessing. It translates into um, transforming into magnificence. That's it. Okay, that's the literal translation. Okay, so it isn't somebody, you know, giving you blessed water or a pill or hitting your head uh, alone. I mean, that by itself is not going to transform you into magnificence. Otherwise, we already would be magnificent. We've had those things. It's, you know, we have to make our own mind receptive. <coughs> So it's really a process of opening our own minds, yeah. And, uh, you know, what I think when, you know, there's a blessing and you hit the, at the head or, they, you know, they knock your, their head against you. I think, uh, as we do in the sadhanas, that the deity is dissolving into my heart, okay? So that's, that's what I do. I made it up. Nobody taught me, okay? Uh, <laughs> but... It, it makes my mind uh, take this as some kind of experience that is really going to, to transform my mind. You know, similarly, you know, having a, a, eating a long life pill, oh my goodness, you, you could get killed in the Tibetan community when they do a long life puja because people are running for those pills, you know, seriously. Seriously, you could get stampeded by that because people just run. They want to get as many pills as they possibly can. And uh, so you have to be careful. Maybe that's what long, why you get long life out of it because you are careful when they're handing them out. Um, okay, but to, th to think that the, the pills are, you know, uh, Tons, every molecule is a white tar, and white tar is dissolving into me. And not just, oh, now I'm filled with white taras, but it's like, what are white taras qualities? And so you take the pill and you think, okay, these are the qualities that I want to develop within myself when I'm chewing the pill. And you think, okay, I am gaining these qualities. You imagine what it would be like to have them. And that transforms your mind. 
Okay, so the blessing, the whole blessing thing, transforming your mind into magnificence, His Holiness explains, it's, it's a dependent arising thing. You know, there's something coming from the Lama and there's something coming from us. Yeah? And we have to be aware of that and not just, in, you know, think, oh, it's all outside stuff. Yeah. Okay. So, did you see my blessing card? <laughs> yeah, I remember when I first went to Dharamsala, you know, we just knew, you know, who knew what blessing cards were. And, and so everybody collected a lot of them. Yeah, every time you could, you got a blessing card and you, you put it on, you know. And, but also in Nepal, not only are there blessing cords, there are lice. And so sometimes you had lice in your blessing cords. Yeah, because you had so many around your neck and, you know, the lice need some place to live. So uh, I guess you accumulate good karma by offering habitat. <laughs> Something like that, okay? But actually, the, the cords, um, you know, there's a knot tied in the middle that's signifying uh, compassion and emptiness. And then when you tie the two ends of the cord together, you think about emptiness and dependent arising. Okay, so it's the thought that the cord's supposed to bring to your mind. Yeah. Otherwise, I heard one, one lama say, how are these cords, these blessing cords, protecting you. You have to protect them because otherwise they break, you know, <laughs> they get lost. <laughs> so they're not protecting you. You're not, you're protecting them. Okay, so just a few things to think about when uh, you're in these situations. 